field is drastically overrepresented in people that have foreign disease versus people who don't. Um, so this is a hot spot. But what is shocking about this is there is no one in the Thank you. You were getting feedback, sorry. So if this works right, you get a hotspot that jumps up that tells you that position. And this came up on the night of news. And so I run into my office and, and click this up. It's a position that, as it turns out, is called 9P21. And it's called that because there's no gene there. No gene. It's between two genes that we knew. But it appears to be a non coding RNA. And that's kind of an important dimension to what we're going to talk about here. Well, what happened is this has been done ad nauseum, and there is nowhere near the heritability that we thought there should be for all of these diseases. We know that bipolar disease is highly heritable. Yeah, there's no, and we even have a neurologist sitting in the front row. So he said, I normally <laughs> confirm it with our, with our prior team, Jeff Ackman, and, and, and his three course sites, Homeland, as the proof that bipolar is heritable. But it's highly heritable, and yet there are no genes for it. So the term that is mumbled among geneticists is, is missing heritability. A whole bunch of heritability that we cannot explain on the basis of. I'm going to show you really fundamentally what that is. The core of the problem is the DNA is wonderful, but it is uh, essentially, there's important caveats, it's essentially identical in every cell in the body. And in principle, it's changed, unchanged over the lifespan, unless you have some event that doesn't answer. So DNA is, is beautiful, it is, but it is static. It is the hardware, if you will, of our bodies. It is the, the crude, not crude, but the initial program that is then expressed as RNA. And which of these genes is expressed defines each of our cell types, from neurons to cardiomyocytes to skin, using the same DNA. And I know that sounds obvious, but it's worth reiterating. That RNA then tells us which cell type we're dealing with and what state that cell is in. So for easily two or three decades, it's been my kind of overarching belief that in order to diagnose and treat diseases, we need to measure RNA expression rather than DNA expression. Not to say that there's no value in DNA, there certainly is. But the RNA is a much more proximal code. Now the reason it's valuable to us is that we can, as I will show you, quantify RNA on a genomic scale with stunning precision. And we can't yet do that for proteins, although we certainly would like to. So, to just kind of uh, pick up the second thread here, which is let's talk about the disease of atherosclerosis. This is a 9 11 every day. This is 3,000 people a day in the United States that die of heart attacks. Don't perceive it that way, but it's quite a public health crisis. 50% of first heart attacks are fatal. If someone makes it to the emergency room, there's about a 90% chance of survival. What's key, despite what we see in the media, despite what we tell patients about modifiable risk factors that are absolutely real, smoking, cholesterol, hypertension, et cetera, all of those things are real, they all need to be modified and managed, that only accounts for about 50% of the people that have heart attacks. So the flip side of saying that is that if you go over to the intensive care unit and you pull people that have had a heart attack and survive, half of them are stupefied. Half of them had no perceivable risk factors that told them they were at risk of a heart attack. We need to change that because if you can diagnose it proactively, you can save lives. You can save a lot of lives. This is the left anterior descending artery. This is a trichrome stain taken from a guy in New York who 
who was 72 years old, I think, was driving to LaGuardia Airport and then just drove, just had a massive heart attack, drove into the ramp. Our cardiologist recovered this. And it's one of those, a uh, picture says a thousand words. This is a classic uh, lesion of the left anterior descending artery. This should have been his artery right here. That should have been the, the smooth muscle layer that is elastic and compliant to the postural flow. This is the supportive layer on the outside called adventitia. And all of this gunk in here is a lesion. Now there's a lot of plaque. This should be about four millimeters in diameter, about the diameter of the pole. You can see that it's mostly occluded 50, 70% with cholesterol crystals that have washed out. And then you see remnants of, of ongoing thrombosis. Because what killed him here, this is the endothelial layer that should have kept his blood anticoagulated and circulating in his artery. Right down here, it's ruptured. Therefore, his blood was exposed to the underlying tissue cholesterol mass, which has tissue factor, all kinds of procoagulant molecules. It precipitated this thrombus. So there's two key aspects to this. The fatality of this disease derives not only from the lesion, but from coagulation at it, typically. And this type of rupture is almost always associated with high levels of immune activity. So when we stain these lesions, I won't show you, we'll see a whole lot of T-cell uh, and macrophage activity at the site that ruptures, as if it was ruptured by its own inflammation. In the absence of that rupture, if you have a stable lesion, it is very common to find 60, 70, 80-year-olds with 90-degree stenosis of their carotid arteries very few symptoms. They don't stroke. He's, and and Zorab is not in his head. Extremely common. In other words, stenosis itself is not, it's not harmless, but it's not generally fatal. It's this, this rupture and coagulation that then throws thrombus into the brain or ischemia in the heart that is fatal. And the point I need to emphasize is that we know from decades worth of work that this has a T cell component to it. So this is the trial that we undertook of, of now putting two and two together, putting the genomic methods that I told you about in conjunction with the clinical paradigm. So this is a little bit dramatic. We're taking people that have elective coronary angiography, so they have stable, keyword, stable chest uh, the first question the cardiologist asked them is, has this been increasing over the last two, three weeks? And if the answer is yes, they say, well, great, because you're going to the emergency room. Conversely, if they say, no, nah, this has been going off and on for weeks or months, and it's from when I play golf or when I jog, I get some chest pain, you know, they say, okay, you, you might need an angiogram. I'm going to have to leave out all the, all the work up there that could be stress tests, probably your stress tests. Of the story is there are a number of causes of chest pain that are not coronary, that are not heart attacks and coronary artery disease. As a matter of fact, even at the emergency room, people with presenting with chest pain, it's 11% of them that they're actually having. 90% of it has other explanations, including notably say acid reflux. The point is, these people are all then after passing or failing tests, depending on how you look at it, uh, make it into uh, the cath lab and where they have their coronary arteries imaged. You can see blockage here and a nice clean artery down. Our paradigm is that we get blood before that happens. And the beauty of the paradigm is that we get this blood, we can analyze it for RNA expression patterns, and then we have this call, this angiographic confirmation of coronary disease or not later that day. The numbers are fairly staggering. You would think that they're maybe 99% good at knowing who has blockage and who doesn't. The actual number is closer to 50%. So nationwide, 42% of people who go in for an angiogram come out with a diagnosis of clean arteries. Congratulations. This is just what it looks like. Uh, in, in live and in black and white. Uh, 
there should be an artery here. <laughs> that contrast medium injected into the heart. This is after a stent was placed, a wire mesh that holds that artery open. So you can see we can make this call very well. We can measure, quantify the stenosis, and that's in effect 90s or 100% stenosis of that artery. So we get a quantitative call of the degree of coronary artery disease in any of these patients. So we now pair this clinical paradigm with a genomic paradigm, and this is colleagues of ours at SQL, who have modified, in a sense, evolved the microarray. The scan that I showed you before was millions of pixels, in which each of the pixels were millions of copies. Well, that's been improved about a million fold because now each of the pixels that we're showing you are individual strands of DNA. DNA can be made from RNA and copied as a cDNA from RNA, so you could also be sequencing RNA. The machine doesn't care, and I'll be using it interchangeably. In this case, we're going to be sequencing RNA. Just to step you through to see how this works, if we zoom in on that square, and we take just three of these features. Surprisingly simple how, and this is how most next generation sequencing works. You flow in a G nucleotide and you see where it incorporates by virtue of fluorescence, it incorporates a position three, not one and two. Wash that off, flow in a C, it incorporates it one and two, A, and um, you see how this story is evolving. So we're sequentially sequencing fluorescently individual strands of DNA or RNA up off of a plate. Showing you three strands here, but the machine does 50 million. And it does 50 million tracks 50 million positions per lane, and it does 50 lanes at a time in a several day run. So you get a huge amount of genetic information from that machine. We measure it in gigabases, just like we would measure this with walking gigabytes. Illumina, you probably heard about, uses a variation of this to amplify those spot. Conceptually, it, it's, it's a similar strategy. This is why it's crazy powerful and why we are tapping, uh, tapping 10% of the power of this technology. What we do is we get millions of those reads and we then align those reads of, let's say, 50, 150 base pairs of these. And we align it to the human genome. In this case, we're aligning it to a transcript that I happened to work on a little while ago works great for demonstration purposes. So each of those reads that we get out of the machine is aligned to the genome, chromosome five, and we're out of Q31 here. And what is striking about this is because I sequenced RNA, almost all of the reads align to exon, which is shown down here. So you see the exons jumping out at you. Uh, a lot of reads align neutronically between the exons. But what's important on a superficial level is that we can simply count all of the reads that are aligned to this transcript or any variation of this transcript that we want. We can get an absolute quantity of the transcripts that are present in any sample. And we're using blood. We get a whole bunch of stuff, and if you've heard of the term dark matter, the colleagues that we Work with Phil Kaepernick, George Saint Laurent, uh, more or less invented that term and invented the concept that there is almost 50% of the RNAs that are in any of our given cells do not code proteins. They have regulatory functions, functions that we probably don't know, but they don't have the function of making a protein, which is the way we conventionally think of an RNA. Possibly, and we are hardly tapping into. Possibly the most important aspect of this is that we, not, we don't see transcripts as simple you know, unitary elements. We see that they can be spliced differently by combining different exons. So we get that information. But because we have sequenced the RNA, we can know, we 
the alleles, the maternal or the paternal allele is used to make the transcripts that are in blood or brain or heart. The importance of that is to circle back is that all of conventional genetics and all of the SNP GWAS genome wide association studies that I showed you assume that if you have a maternal A allele and a paternal G allele, it assumes you use them equally. It's RNA and you don't. In particular tissues and particular disease states, you may use only the maternal allele. So Mendelian genetics just went out the window. You're only using an allele that might have hyper or so this is called allele usage. We are only beginning to tap into this, but it is now going to start to transform genetics back into something where we actually look at what alleles are being used. Well, now I'm going to really just kind of turn on the afterburners and accelerate through this. So we can align all those to the human genome. We align them to the genome, and then we count them down to what transcripts they are using. Uh, in this case, I'm probably counting 57,000 transcripts. We currently are counting 197,000 distinct transcripts that we can make. We count those and we can now then average them between people who have low coronary disease and up here, people who have coronary disease with greater than 20% stenosis. And each of these points, each square, is one of those transcripts. So somewhere in here is BRCA1, somewhere is actin. I can tell you <coughs> without notes that those are globins because we're sequencing blood, the most predominant transcripts are globin in blood. And so if we use that as an example, the globins are expressed at a very, very high level. This is a log two scale. So two to the 15 transcripts. Uh, but what's important is it doesn't change at all between people who don't and people who do have coronary disease. So that then means that everything along that line, along the slope of one, is unchanged. Now, there's no mathematical correction on this. For those of you that ever have played with genomics or, as a matter of fact, even played with numbers, to take a measurement on people over 22 log two orders of magnitude, there's no correction is a stunning state. This is a highly linear method and highly quantitative. To cut to the chase, we can then use statistical methods to identify the transcripts that do change between two groups. And there's a cluster of transcripts here that we sometimes call them GEG, differentially expressed genes. I've just got a condensed year's worth of work for you. When we saw what those transcripts are, it turns out those transcripts are related to T cell function, CD8 T cell function, not granulocyte neutrophils, not B cells. So they're in the T cell family. And then a lot of finer work, they started shaping up like these transcripts were related to T regulatory function. Honest, I go to PubMed and I put in T reg coronary artery disease, and all of a sudden it lights up with a literature that I was uh, kind of thinking here. Uh, not really my field. Immunology is not my strength. Still isn't. You pick up 30, 40 papers from almost every major uh, cardiovascular center in the world showing that the, that the Treg balance effector to T sub to T reg ratio was changed in people with coronary artery disease. This was well known clinically. And this is all based not on gene expression, this is based on cell surface markers for a T regulatory and a T response. So what we are measuring, what our RNA signature is, is related to a decrease T regulatory function in people that have coronary artery disease. <laughs> kind of cool. It has not gotten a lot of attention uh, 
worldwide, even though we know T cells are involved in the disease. And that's because of this overwhelming paradigm that heart disease is caused by cholesterol or hypertension or, or whatever. But the evidence is overwhelming. You, uh, I'll, I'll save you uh, six months worth of literature searching here. When you have T Rex and atherosclerosis, you find out that T Rex are a subset of cells, about 5% of lymphocytes. So, in some ways, one of the most stunning things about this data set is reading activity and changes in a small subset of the circulating cells in the blood. If you had told me that I needed to do that in advance, I wouldn't have done the study. I just, you know, I'd have walked. Because I, I would thought we were looking for something in, you know, you know, a you know, large shift in a major cell population. We are looking at a modest shift in a small subset of cells that control the inflammatory process. Uh, this is what I showed you before. It is known that T-regs are decreased uh, in people with atherosclerosis. We know their decreases in function of aging. Increased by hypercholesterolemia, people on statins upregulate their T-regs. The animal models are compelling as far as causation goes. You can select the elite T-regs in mice that are prone to atherosclerosis that get fulminant atherosclerosis. And then uh, we, just to finish the thought, we know that this protein and gene, FOXP3, is the consensus marker. I'll show you how that helps us. We can now, the beauty of having data like this is we can go back and we can do instant experiments in which we say, well, if, if this is what we're looking at, then things related to FOXP3, things related to Tregs should be changed. Among the genes that are differentially expressed, a very, very condensed version of this is that a high percentage of them, on the order of half of them, are involved in the process of regulating FOXP3 expression. These are published studies that had no dog in the fight. Uh, simply publishing that the transcription factor SMID3 is a known controlling factor of FOXP3, and SMID3 is one of the transcripts that we see as changed between the groups. The second set of the transcripts interact with FOXP3 to control classic one being trim 28 to control FOXP3 function at target genes. And that effect of this FOXP3 target genes is that they regulate the transition from a Treg progenitor to a so-called inducible Treg, a functional Treg that has the ability to downregulate or modulate the immune system. So we know that these are mechanistically involved. And it immediately brings up this really interesting issue that, that everybody knows and just doesn't get talked about a lot, which is that it is plausible that atherosclerosis has a very significant autoimmune component. And when I told you about stents that are placed into arteries to open them, the way that they keep that artery from reoccluding is they put rapamycin on the stent. Rapamycin coated stents are a multi billion dollar industry that prevent the reclosure of the arteries. It's a coincidence, I guess, that rapamycin is a known immunosuppressant that regulates T reg This is huge. You know that if you uh, transplant a heart, that immune rejection is going to cause atherosclerosis. This I did not know. We have colleagues at NIH, now NATO, that work on this little trick, which is that people with psoriasis, black psoriasis, are at an elevated risk for coronary artery disease or figure. Rheumatoid arthritis, also elevated risk of coronary artery disease. And maybe I saw nodding heads, maybe some people are, are aware that lupus is a major risk factor. Coronary artery disease, and this is a fact that causes death in most people. It is known that some patients have expressed autoimmune antibody stages in 60, but it has not been exhaustively investigated. Well, just as a final thought on the subject, 
reason this is important is one of the one of the differential express transcripts that we use is related to the IL-23 receptor. I was, you know, goof around, I don't know, dude, maybe TV isn't all that bad for you. And I'm watching this commercial for Lumia, right? <laughs> And we have to do. I'm thinking, Dan, you know, I don't know, IL-23, where have I seen that? And then I realized I'd seen it in our own data. Well, Alunia is, is an antibody to the IL-23 receptor is used now as a, as a gangbuster treatment for psoriasis. So there's the potential that there's, it would be an incredibly expensive way to treat coronary artery disease. I'm not suggesting that we just go out and try this. Well, what I am suggesting is that this is, I, I, I feel that the strategy has not only given us an insight into coronary artery disease, but I think it does suggest strategies that we could use to modulate the immune response in coronary artery disease. So just to follow up and close this out, this vascular inflammation, which we are measuring is a decrease in the immune regulation suppression is one component. The second component that we're not going to touch on is this thrombotic predisposition. I think it would be my argument that when we can measure this and combine these two factors, we'll have a pretty good grip on who is really at risk of coronary, of tough myocardial infarction at least. Where this stands is thanks to people in the room who, who have raised the money for this, started a company called Fubarian that is taking this uh, through FDA trials. We've done this study with very similar findings in three separate centers, and it is now in love. TrueCAD is what we call it. It's now, this I guess that's what we're going to do from a COR to start with. Uh, the, it's now in an FDA uh, validation study to determine whether it can predict people with or without coronary disease. Okay, so the rest of this is going to be very short because we now understand the idea. And I was talking over, you know, probably Grand Rounds or something in the hospital, and one of my favorite people who's no longer here, Nick Chala, to make you know him, uh, is an intensivist that works in the emergency room in the intensive care unit, and came up to me and he said, Yeah, you know, Tim, that's really cool. That's you know, coronary artery disease, that's yeah, fascinating. Um, what you really need to be working on is abdominal pain. And that's most of what we see in the emergency room. When people presenting with vague abdominal pain, we have to rule out appendicitis. And I think somebody with appendicitis should have a, a signature in blood that would be whopping compared to coronary disease. And condense years worth of work is completely correct. Uh, this is the same model that I showed you, people just with abdominal pain pain versus people confirmed, surgically confirmed with appendicitis. We can identify genes that go up, genes that go down. I'll show you what they are real quick. Uh, for controls, controls always kill you. We use people that have hernias and lower respiratory infections. And we thought these were good controls because we know that they're not appendicitis. Turns out they're not good controls because lower respiratory infections in particular Lit up some of our transcripts more than we have ever seen a transcript in real life. If any of you guys are biologists and may know what actin gene expression is, actin is our reference here. And in the case of these uh, defensins, uh, and somebody, and you or I sitting here, our defensin transcripts and neutrophils would be 1% of our actin transcripts. People that have a lower respiratory infection or maybe infections of almost any kind, that can go to two or three or 10 times actin level. <clears throat> so these neutrophils in these people with respiratory infections are girding for battle. They are loading their granules prepared to do war with a pathogen that they may or may not have actually seen yet. So what we identified with transcripts actually that were reduced in appendicitis and the defense and transcripts are reduced in appendicitis. And then what is elevated in people with appendicitis and respiratory infections is actually the ILA receptor beta and alpha and phosphatase. So we now have a panel of four markers. It's actually very, very good at diagnosing whether someone has appendicitis, a lower respiratory infection, or 
is otherwise healthy. We're waiting to take that out into real life, but from the point of view of inflammation, I'll give you this condensed version of the story of what we believe is going on. What initiates appendicitis is controversial. In many cases, you find fecal lists, you find blockage of the appendix, meaning a, a, an environment conducive to, and this part is, I think, fairly well established, the formation of a biofilm. So friends of mine, and you might know Rob Freestad over at Children's, has taken these appendicitis samples, uh, converted them, sequenced the bacteria that are in them, and they tend to be fusiforms. They tend to be things that will form biofilms. They don't float about, they form a biofilm, but biofilm secretes factors like butyrate endotoxin creates local hypoxia that irritates the tissue around it and therefore irritates and inflames any cells like neutrophils that are flowing through it. And so what we see in blood is that these neutrophils are wildly activated of the gene expression. And like I said, they are burning for battle, even though they cannot directly contact the infection. And that is really part of the problem. The, the third example that I promised is uh, a little bit of an, an homage to George, uh, because this was his idea. So in conjunction with an integrative medicine company in Germany called Heal, one of the largest makers of, of homeopathic and alternative medicines in the world, they were curious, they were under increasing pressure from the EU to show that homeopathic medicines do anything to simplify, to simplify a complicated situation. Uh, and as you're probably aware, in the US, there's probably increasing pressure on that because of the amount of money that's spent on it. So George had the idea, well, let's take these herbal uh, preparations and let's put them in a wound heal model and see if we can measure changes in gene expression. Well, it's very a long story, but they do. They, they change very important systems in the antioxidant pathway in wound repair. But in the process of it, we could map out over a course of, I think we went out eight days, 192 hours. We could map out changes in gene expression correlating to different phases of the wound repair response. So we have a very, very detailed map of what transcripts come on and what phases of the wound repair process. Transcripts and transcript families at each of these time points that are now a reference point for understanding what is happening in inflammation and sterile inflammation in that case, at least in the skin. So, and we've done a bunch of this, <laughs> and I'm not going to go through all of it. Uh, we have active projects in uh, left ventricular assist devices. Um, I showed you appendicitis real briefly, pneumonia real briefly, coronary disease in some detail. Um, the paper I'm working on now is actually with a group of Oregon, Joel Niggs, one of the experts on attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And he's got identical twins, monozygotic twins that are discordant for ADHD and be profiled RNA expression on them. So that's kind of a, a beautiful way of demonstrating that we know that they at the DNA level identical hey but we know that the genes that they're using are different in the kids that have ADHD and that could have some utility so let me tie this up and kind of give you something that George and I discussed over the years long of course many 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 years uh, these are the stages that I showed you on the prior slide and any wound typically has hemostasis. And even in coronary artery disease, you could see that micro ruptures in those vessels was allowing hemorrhage into the plaque. So there's a, there's a, a hemostasis component to some of this. Inflammation, uh, proliferative remodeling of phases. What we call chronic inflammation has probably slightly different levels to it. In some cases, it's chronic injury. Person's diabetic, they have elevated, chronically elevated glucose that's in here. In obesity, there's pressure to your joints, okay? If you're working on this. So there's mechanical issues, there's chemical issues, uh, allergic antigenic issues, bacterial issues that could persist for 
particularly in the form of violent elements, which are very difficult to kill. In combinations of this, it's becoming increasingly clear that our microbiome in our gut is important on one level of what bacteria is there, but also on the level of how it processes foods, chemicals, and things that we take in, and how it processes them in to neutralize or potentially, in some cases, activate them. So now one of the prevailing theories of coronary disease is that choline can be metabolized into something called TMAO that is causing toxic to vessels and to the immune system. So the combination of those things is that, you know, to understand chronic inflammation, we need to understand whether the stimulus is present in a chronic way to change that. I guess that maybe is obvious, but it's worth reiterating. A subset of this that I think is, is now more plausible to me, more certainly more front and center, is the idea that maybe initiated by this, or maybe not, but there is probably an autoimmune component to this. There could be autoinflammatory or autoimmune factors that have simply taken over and are no longer resolved. They are self-sustaining autoimmune systems of auto-inflammation. And I think in coronary disease, I think that's exactly the kind of thing that we detect. When people scar, eloid hypertrophic scars, you tend to find that at least from the, from the point of view of what cells are present, they tend to be stalled in an inflammatory phase. There are very credible people, George was one of them, very smart and thoughtful people, that would argue to you and that our use, they would say overuse of, of anti-inflammatory medicines is preventing the normal resolution of wound repair. I, I find it credible in some cases. Uh, and overall, I think there is got to be a discussion about whether anti-inflammatory strategies are the only approach we should be taking to our inflammatory diseases. Maybe we need to let them inflame and let them resolve on their own to allow for resolution. Caveat would be cases in which we can't get rid of them. In those cases, I think a lot of these strategies that are coming on in line and by virtue of immunotherapies for rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, and as we can go down the list, becoming increasingly common. They're for the moment are expensive, but in the long term, they might well be very, very powerful strategies for approaching these diseases. Uh, this is George, which I apologize if I refer to in the past tense. He passed away in 2015. Uh, but his family has continued to support our work. We are infinitely grateful, not just for the funding, but for the, for the incredible sort of collaboration that they have inspired uh, among friends and family around the world. So we're pleased to have worked with a, a really impressive group of people on these diseases. That's all I got for today. I'm wise. Questions? I have a question. Uh, what is your experience with a single cell Uh, single cell is crazy stuff. So that's, I would argue that, that the methods that I showed you here are already the same. They're, yeah, I mean, we can't handle this data. Uh, we use a tiny fraction of it. Technology, though, has evolved such that you can take blood, separate it into 10,000 cells, and do what I showed you on every one of those cells. A company called Tax Genomics is doing this. So you, you, can, you, can, you can get either the DNA or the RNA sequence of individual cells that are in a tumor or whatever. It's the future. Yeah, we have some preliminary data, so it's amazing, but we have a time to analyze <laughs> yeah. how, how to compare this. Well, this is really something particularly on monocytes. This is great what you have shown. We have very similar differences for inflammation, T cell regulation. We have that. Stroke is a little bit uh, not such a 
coronary artery again. Uh, can be cardiogonic, small vessel is here, large vessel is here. But if you take single one stroke subtype, you know, we have seen CD8 cells in flux, we have seen increased risk of stroke in rheumatoid arthritis, which we have shown is pretty much, pretty much very similar. And one more question. Recently, I came across uh, in stroke what they did. They collected black at different sites of uh, during catheter uh, intervention. One was in one sample was near the occlusion right away. One was in carotid and one from a femoral injection. And there was difference in neutrophil. So highest neutrophil amount was closer to the occlusion. And I was wondering if you have similar data on coronary or if you tried something we, like that. We haven't done it. We have a little bit of problems that most of our blood is going to be oh, yeah, but, but they, they actually do most of it from the sheet. From the yeah, the sheet. yeah, um, yeah. So we, we have not been able to get into that. I don't think there's any question that, that the region that you collect the blood from would show changes in yeah, transformation. It wasn't gene expression so much. It was neutral field, lymphocytes, and then they have chemokines, yeah. They have some ELISA, ELISA Just to hammer that home, like what I didn't realize until we did this study, is that I told you we're doing a subset of lymphocytes. What I didn't realize is, and they, and they teach this in, in literally in Med School 101, only about 2% of our lymphocytes at any given time are circulating. Most of our lymphocytes are out in lymphatics and out in tissue and things doing things. So already just sampling blood yeah. and measuring lymphocytes is already a fairly drastic sampling event. Uh, well, what we have shown, what you have shown the blood fracture and mutated. So they are claiming because of this interaction near occlusion, there is a much more prominent feature rather than in the whole circulating. I think this is interesting. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Moral of the story is be, be good to your immune system. That's the typical message today. Thanks for coming. Thank <laughs> you. 